How's that? Yeah. Phoebe, I think you forgot to turn the microphone on. Sorry about that, and thank you. I thought we already had questions. Uh, so, long day. Get comfortable. I know they're coming. Um, we've got a long agenda, a lot of stuff to cover. So, uh, it is National Pony Day, right? <laughs> National Pony Express Day. So, a lot of pony pictures. Some may argue there's pictures of horses. Um, rebroadcast schedule on 970 as well as the website. We'll be showing it. Tuesdays, Thursdays, and a couple other times. We have a call in number of 6304. And we'll roll into Catch Me at My Best. Two well deserving folks. <laughs> We're going to clap after I say their names, okay? <laughs> so we have with us Wendy Poindexter. Used to be Wendy Hewitt. It was actually Wendy Hewitt, and she went and got married and changed her name to Poindexter. I liked it where she had it, but <laughs> we're just glad to have her. So we have Wendy Poindexter. Wendy was nearby when I dropped a jar in the recycling room. Hearing the crash, she calmly told me to leave it, and she would take care of it. She was very professional. She took care of me, then cleaned up my mess. A dear lady who gave me love when I, needed the ex when I made extra work for her. Wendy Poindexter, please come up. <laughs> services. Emmy was quite distressed to learn that I had not received my room service dining order. I was very impressed by the initiative and responsibility she demonstrated. I have nothing but praise for all of our young workers, but Emmy went above and beyond and should be recognized. Emmy Carroll. Yeah. Emmy is actually over at EC Glass today, so we will be recognizing her in the lineup this afternoon at about 4.15. So uh, congratulations to both Emmy and Wendy, and uh, we'll now roll into the construction report with some folks from Whiting Turner. Mm -hmm. stuff going on. I'm sure you can tell that by the amount of traffic that is picked up on the job site. We've got uh, tons of deliveries happening every day, bringing in new material, which is essentially a week's worth of their material going up in the building. And if it's coming on to the job site, it's going up. So it's uh, starting to uh, look like something in there. Our third floor's got ductwork and plumbing and electrical going in. We've got drywall and um, wall framing going in right now. So you can start, we're starting to see how everything's shaped, all the rooms, um, all the center areas. Uh, and then fourth floor is following pretty close behind and uh, fifth floor is a little bit lighter, but um, it's coming right up. Uh, the, the framing guy is right up on everybody's tail, so they're moving, they're moving everybody along. So um, it's going pretty well. We've been spraying fireproofing, which that's the mess you guys have probably seen with our tarps coming off of the building. They're getting closer, but right now they're on sixth floor, uh, making a mess up there, uh, spraying the roof. We are putting a roof on right now, so it's starting to get a little drier inside from the rainstorms, which is nice. Although Nick said it was raining in the building yesterday somewhere, so he texted Kevin and Kevin said, what do you want me to do about it? 
Um, and uh, yeah, a lot of traffic. We're starting to put the skin on the building, so you'll start to see the, you've got seen the yellow board on our side, um, and it's starting to go up on the other side shortly, um, and a lot of framing, so uh, pretty soon we'll be seeing some brick going in, so hopefully next month we'll be talking to you about that. Um, and I'll turn over to Ernesto. He'll talk to you about the mess he's making inside here. <laughs> Morning. So you know, I am the interior guy that everybody loves, does not create hazards or roadblocks for you guys in the corridors. That would be me. Um, so on the third floor, we're doing tile down the corridor. We had a little issue with the guys. They had to go back to Georgia this week and uh, are kind of at a halt for right now. Looking to pick up uh, Tuesday right after Labor Day and might push an extra week than we anticipated. Sean didn't know about that yet, but now he does. <laughs> uh, six floor renovations, so I'm going, doing carpet down the hallways. Uh, we we're looking to do final paint up there starting Thursday, finishing up by the end of next week. Uh, they'll get a little makeover of their dining, nurse station, and new corridors. Uh, Tuesday right after Labor Day, um, you guys are going to love me even more because I started the first floor reno. So Tuesday for three weeks there will be a lot of trash and debris going out the back doors by your pool areas and that should be a couple of months, maybe um, late January, February of 2019, turning over to you guys. New beauty salon, uh, new gym. There's a lot of stuff. Yes, sir? What will the transition be between What will the transition be between the tile on the bridge and the carpet that's there? That looks like that's going to have a little jog in it. Yes, sir. So it's a little high right now. Um, over to the left side of the bridge, we need to lower it down about a quarter inch and we're going to have a threshold uh, for right now. So it'll be ADA compliant. It'll be six six, seven inches wide, so it'll be an aluminum threshold with an uh, anti-slip uh, little strip on it. We're working on the end design for that. Uh, the yellow panels that are going up on the building, I have two questions. First one is the yellow panels that are going up on the building, what are those made out of? And uh, there's a pile of material on the grass between the uh, B and E building and Williams Road, that's covered by a tarp. Uh, what is under that tarp? <laughs> under the tarp carpet for the sixth floor. Uh, that yellow material that you see is dense glass. It's um, drywall with kind of um, like a fiberglass mixture to it that would with withstand the exterior elements. No, not flammable. Um, can you tell me when the locker rooms are going to, here I am, when are the locker rooms going to be finished by the pool? That's, that's not us, but today. <laughs> today. They're open. They're open. They open this The lady in the back says they are open. <laughs> One for me. <laughs> remember that, remember that. <laughs> I didn't do anything, but I got it done. <laughs> <laughs> Any more? <clears throat> so, I'll just kind of go through some of the changes while they're here in case. But uh, going back to the parking area that we've shut off again, the pass through in front of the building, a uh, big reason that we want to have that uh, fenced off again is that rather than having small amounts of brick and materials brought in, they can get truckloads dumped, and it really sets up the staging area like it did for the steel to hopefully get this continue moving uh, quick, and uh, they just feel like they can be a lot more efficient doing that. So I think my letter maybe said two months. There's potential that it could be four months of that area being closed off. Um, true? Yeah. And um, we'll continue to just try to make sure we get that working as quick as possible to give them what they need, but uh, try to get it back as soon as we can. Uh, so locker rooms are open. Pool will stay open during this process. Uh, gift shop, I think Gwen is closing it up or has closed the gift shop up. We do not know exactly where that is going to end up. 
but um, we'll let you know more. That is something that will not be open for probably six to 12 months. Um, we just don't have a plan right now where it's going to go. There's just a lot of other things that need to fall into place first. Uh, there's some ideas. Could we sell some stuff in uh, some of the dining spaces? Or can we sell some things out of Trash and Treasure? And we're working on that right now. Our human resource office is going over to the bottom of the Hearthside area. Um, wellness is going to the billiard space, and some people will be coming up sharing a little more. I think Jane's going to talk about the beauty shop going up to the fifth floor. The uh, senior dependence office, which is downstairs by the mailboxes, is going to be going downstairs to the bottom of the Creekside building. Um, into that area will be the clinic and we'll be moving the clinic from its location over to that mailbox area. So uh, both nurses as well as uh, nurse, uh, physician assistant and Dr. Lord will all be operating out of that area. Um, we are working on getting some uh, literature out to you and uh, the next upcoming newsletter to just sh share so you don't have to be writing this down. We'll know kind of where everyone will be during this time. So we think uh, after Labor Day, we start with asbestos abatement. Um, there's a little bit of asbestos in tiling and some of the wraps of the piping, I believe. Uh, the bank, I believe the week of September 17th, will be shut down during uh, that whole week of September 17th. We're going to have some shuttles over to the Boonesboro office, and we think we'll have Francis over in the marketing area for a couple hours each day. But we'll also have some shuttles to get people back and forth to the bank if you need to go over there. I think I'll let everybody else who's coming up talk about that, but just with them here. Um, when do we close down that drinker lobby then? Is it right after Labor Day? The so the week of the 17th, where we thought it was right after Labor Day, we're now the week of the 17th. They're shutting down that, labor, uh, that drinker lobby for about a week, and then there'll be ways to pass through to come around. But we'll have some signs up, may have to have some people coming off the second floor or going over through the hard side or coming back across the bridge on the third floors. So um, Debbie is working on some communication plans to let you know how we're going to get around all this. Any questions? <laughs> Oops, thank you. Jane Bailey instead of Jane Cash. Uh, I changed that, but that's okay. Um, wanted to let you all just give you a quick update. We will be closed on both floors tomorrow while we do our moving and getting ourselves organized and coordinated and ready for everyone to come up to the fifth floor to see us. Don't worry, you will still be in your regular schedules as close as I can possibly keep you. It may vary maybe 15 minutes here and there to keep our flow going. But no worries that if you're a regular weekly or bi-weekly client, that you would have to worry about losing your spot. We're going to try our best to keep everyone on their regular schedules. Any questions on what's occurring or what I can do to help? Or Everybody's good? Well, we look forward to seeing you. If you need us, give us a call. Um, I guess I need to post the new number for the fifth floor in case you don't know what it is, but it is in your directory. So look for the fifth floor. Um, all stylists will be there, so you don't have to worry about you know, hunting down your stylist. Each stylist will have one day a week off, though, to help with the congestion. So consolidation may be you know, needed for one day a week for your particular stylist. Thank you, and we appreciate you working with us as we go through this exciting time of renovation. Good morning, everyone. I'm Julie Garlock with Senior Independence, and uh, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce 
Martha Kimsey Bennett. And she's the spiritual care counselor for Senior Independence Home Health and Hospice. Martha is a graduate of Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California, with a master's in theology. She studied clinical pastoral education in an acute care setting. She also worked as a chaplain resident at Lynchburg General Hospital and Virginia Baptist when she and her husband moved to Lynchburg in 2016. <coughs> Martha is endorsed for healthcare chaplaincy by the Episcopal Church in the US. So please join me in welcoming Martha Kimsey Bennett. As we were talking about earlier, the rehab agency has moved to CT18, and the phone number is 3986. Thank you. Good morning. I want to talk about the Education Committee and then Gene Davis will speak about the uh, All Bazaar. The education, Employee Education Committee is probably the least known committee around here, but it does have some important impact on our employees, both student and full-time. Uh, this committee is made up of uh, the people listed here, Annie Bennett, Doris Coffin, Horace Gager, John Felicier, Otto Powell, and Dave Vaughn. The logistical support and other uh, record keeping, and the secretary for the committee is done primarily by Ken Whalen and Kathy ba Bailey, Bradley, I'm sorry, runs the Human Resources Office. They are the basic, they take care of the paperwork basically. The money is handled by Debbie Callahan's office, and Debbie is essentially our chairperson, and we meet whenever there's a need, usually about three times a year. This committee has a special goal in mind, and that is to help our employees advance in their education and professional careers. Um, we like to provide learning opportunities, enjoy, and job enhancement while they're employed at Westminster Canterbury, and this involves money, basically. So, um, you may not know this, but dining service employees may receive grants based on the number of hours worked. They used to get a dollar per hour and they have to have worked at least, I think, 400 hours a year to be eligible for these funds. There's some flexibility in the rules, but um, these, these funds do not have to be repaid if they don't finish your educational program. Um, other employees may receive funds which may be repaid by uh, continued employment. And it, Funding for this, these types of programs is made from by the, uh, possible by the funds through the Joe Payne Family Employee Education Fund. We also have some special funds given to us, given to the committee by the <coughs> generosity of our residents. Ralph uh, and Doris Coffin have a memorial fund in, uh, for their son, Carrie, and this grant is to promote training and uh, what we call the trade, electrical, electrical, plumbing, welding, that sort of thing. And we have a, at least one young man now who's advancing to be, become a certified electrician because of the support given by this committee. Uh, this, this fund applies to those people who are working in the trades area. Uh, Ani Bennett has, has helped establish the uh, J. Lamar Nix Scholarship Fund. And this fund, uh, basically helps those employees who want to get training, maybe most primarily in the treatment and care of geriatrics, which of course it doesn't apply to this group, but it might <laughs> apply to some people. And uh, also in the, the uh, advancing in their health care field, such as a certified nursing assistant, uh, people who deal with the medicines, maybe getting their RN degree and that sort of thing, and we, they can request these are scholarship funds, they don't be, they're not repaid, provided 
And then, then there's the Ellen Emma Science Scholarship, which provides funds for students who are high school graduates who are majoring in science and engineering fields. Currently, we have two young men here who are both working in the for bachelor's degrees in engineering that are supported by the generosity. And a lot of this is run, uh, donated by John Policier. To give you some idea of how much money we spend, we meet approximately, I say, three times a year because the start of school begins in September or August now, and, and maybe in the middle of the year, and then there's a, sometimes there's a catch-all meeting. But the last three years, we've given approximately $20,000 a year to support students, these young people. They're not all young people, these people who uh, need help. And it's, this is, uh, you may see that we've had here uh, about 30 people who have benefited from this, uh, these funds. Over the last three years, I'll add this up for you, we've had about $60,000 donated to support the educational activities for our employees. So we think this is a good thing because it benefits not only the employee, but it benefits our, us in the sense that we're hiring or having retaining trained people who do well and we look forward to keeping them here working for us. We want to make a pleasant work environment as far as giving them some financial support. Um, this money comes entirely by contributions. It doesn't come out of your <laughs> monthly fees is a, done strictly by contributions, and you, but you can make a contribution through the WC Foundation. You may specify a fund to support, or you may have funds distributed across all the fields that, that, are, that are available. Uh, you can make this contribution by filling out a card, a check, or a sack full of money. <laughs> and taking it to Debbie Callahan on the, in the development office on the second floor. It's pretty easy to give, and it is tax deductible if you itemize your income taxes. <laughs> and last but not least, you can make a purchase at the Food and Craft Bazaar, which will be taking place in October. Money, money earned from the bazaar goes to the Payne Family Employee Education Fund. So, Come and spend lavishly, <laughs> and uh, the committee will appreciate having additional funds to help support these worthy young people and, and their desire to improve their status in life through education and training. So I'm going to turn this over to Gene Davis now. This is, if you have any questions, we're trying to keep this moving along. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to speak to you afterwards. I'm not going to get into details of how the committee operates, but. Oh, unless there's a real pressing question, I'm going to turn this over to Gene. I'm not Gene, by the way. Good morning. Good morning. The Fall Bazaar has been around for 16 years, and it's become a fall tradition here. The records that were passed on to me when I took over as chair go back to 2002. We value our, our great staff here, and this is one way we can show our support. Use your talents to show your appreciation for the great way they take care of us. This year, the date is Wednesday, October 17th. This is just seven weeks away, so it's time for all of us to put on our thinking caps and decide how we can help. Over the years, the event has changed and grown. Now we feature coffee hour, this begins at 9 a.m. on the bridge and lasts until all the donuts are sold. <laughs> it's a good time to relax and socialize with your neighbors while you make a small donation to help the fund. One dollar for a donut, one dollar for coffee or tea. Elizabeth Lipscomb chairs this committee, so talk to her if you want to help. And food is all donated by resident cooks. In the past, we have offered cakes, cookies, pies, Fudge, finger foods, jam, soups, stews, tarts, brownies, breads, muffins. Contact one of our co-chairs, Ida Powell or Vernell Litton, for questions, suggestions, or ideas. Refrigerators and freezers are available for, to store the donated items the day before the bazaar. Uh, crafts. We have many talented residents here who have donated all kinds of handmade treasures, such as hats, shawls, scarves, 
pottery, aprons, dishcloths, cross stitch, needlepoint, placemats, tote bags, walking sticks, yarn dolls. Many residents have already been working on projects, but it's not too late. Start your project now, and by October 17th, your work will be ready to display. See our committee chair, Pat Mignogna, if you have questions or you want to volunteer. Plants. Many of our green-thumbed friends have provided aloe, orchids, pothos, begonias, and countless other items to brighten your windowsill. We need a chair for this committee, so let me know if you're a plant person. Silent auction. This is your chance to bid on several special items. In the past, we have included paintings, fancy shawls, afghans, pottery, and wreaths. Call me if you have something to contribute. Door prizes. For only $1 a ticket, you have a chance to win items like wall hangings, mirrors with special handcrafted frames, dolls, quilts, original paintings, or gift certificates to local restaurants. Evie Newmeyer is in charge of ticket sales, and she'll be looking for volunteers to staff the tables when the tickets go on sale. And we do have a quilt as one of our door prizes this year, thanks to Mary Frances Lemon, right here in the front row. <laughs> uh, our organizational meeting will be held on Wednesday, September 26th at 10 a.m. in the Hume Room. You will be asked to volunteer for one of these committees coffee hour to help set up and host, crafts to set up the day before and sell the day of the bazaar, door prize to sell tickets for several days before and the day of the bazaar, finance to act as cashiers for the bazaar, food to set up and price the day before and sell the day of the bazaar, greeting to greet people as they enter and distribute plastic bags to hold their purchases, plants to set up and price the day before, and sell the day of the bazaar and publicity to help get the word out around town. So please come to the meeting and bring your ideas. The bazaar day is October 17th and here's what will happen. Coffee and donuts for sale on the bridge starting at 9 a.m. Bazaar and silent auction in the common starting at 10 a.m. Door prize tickets for sale on the bridge starting at 10 a.m. Silent auction closes and the door prize drawing on the bridge at 1 p.m. Again, all proceeds from this event go to provide loans and scholarships to our employees through the Payne Family Education Fund. Remember, if you don't cook or craft, you can always shop. And one of the best ways to help is to spread the word. So don't forget to tell all your friends and relatives. Invite them to visit that day to enjoy a coffee and donut and to shop goodies and gifts. Any questions? Another important activity of our residence council, or your residence council, is another important activity of our of your residence council is the Christmas fund. Each year, this is our opportunity. Next slide. The committee that administers the Christmas fund includes Ruth, Sandra, Helen, Hazel, and uh, Debbie Liaison. Uh, Debbie Schneider is the RC Council member who serves as liaison to this committee to help uh, ensure that uh, the Residence Council itself is giving them all the assistance <coughs> they need. The Christmas Fund is our opportunity as the residents here to say thank you to all the WC employees, some of whom we see down in the dining room, uh, the clinic, cleaning our residents and the like, but also we uh, provide Christmas Fund uh, gifts to <coughs> those we don't see, the people that are working in the laundry or in the kitchen, uh, who are also helping us with our life refreshed here. Um, with no tipping, this is our chance to give them a reward for the service that they provide to us 365 days a year. Next. Last year we passed, uh, we earned her, uh, for the Christmas fund over $150,000 that was then distributed 
uh, by formulas administered by the staff here at Westminster Canterbury to all of the full-time and part-time employees. And this is our way, again, of saying thank you and particularly appreciated uh, at the Christmas season by the employees. The corp officers, corporate officers and department heads of the Westminster Canterbury, folks like Sean, don't get a Christmas present from us. <laughs> so, uh, he will accept hugs at Christmas time. <laughs> the Residence Council, based on a comment we got at the listening session back in February of this year, uh, voted to increase the beneficiaries of, of uh, our Christmas fund, and we in, uh, include now all of the, uh, most of the uh, employees of senior independents. The senior independence manager will not be uh, sharing in the gift, but senior independence, we find, is servicing now more residents than they are outside clients. And therefore, we felt it was appropriate that they also should benefit with a reward for the services rendered. We don't, however, bringing an additional uh, several dozen people into the people that share from the Christmas fund, we didn't want to diminish what we were giving to the regular employees. So it has been decided that Ruth and her committee will also be soliciting any resident or people from the community that aren't <coughs> residents here at Westminster, so uh, of making them aware of this opportunity to reward the people at uh, senior independence that provided service to them. And hopefully we will bring in enough additional income for the fund that we'll be able to continue the significant awards that we, uh, gifts that we made last year. Next. There are two ways that you can make a donation to give to the Christmas fund. One would be by a lump sum uh, donation, or two by automatic donations that you can set up as a monthly deduction from uh, the fees you pay here at Westminster Canterbury. Checks, if you choose to do it that way, can be made out to the Westminster Canterbury Residents Association put a note for Christmas fund in the lower left memo line on your check, and uh, there will be a box uh, down in the lobby or uh, outside the wood dining room to uh, receive those checks uh, for the Christmas fund. Next. Automatic donations usually start in December of each year with, uh, and run till uh, November of the following year, or you can start it at another time if you wish. Uh, everybody will receive from Ruth's committee a form should you want to elect to participate in the automatic deduction to donation system. Just like to emphasize that all gifts are voluntary. Residence Council, looking at uh, the number of residents, the number of recipients, uh, suggests you consider $2 a day as a, uh, an appropriate donation, but again, it's your choice what you choose to do. And this is a gift. Some of you can also almost think of it as like a tip at the restaurant. It is not tax deductible. deductible. None of our employees have set themselves up to 501c3 organizations. <laughs> and again, where do you send your gift? A box uh, in, at the reception desk or the box outside the door to the wood dining room in healthcare. Please make your contributions by Friday, November 30th. There's a significant effort that the staff has to go through to apportion the rewards based on seniority hours worked and other factors to the employees and, and we want to make sure they have sufficient time to do all of that by the time the gifts are passed out at the Christmas party on December 12th this year. And uh, one other comment I'd like to make is please don't confuse the Christmas fund with the Christmas party. 
another activity that we do do is the, uh, all of us residents get together to throw the party food and so forth for the employees on December 12th. You will be separately solicited for donations to, to buy food if you're not donating your own baked goods and that sort of thing. Uh, but that is independent of Ruth's committee's activities to actually raise the gifts that we give to our employees. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much. I'll be brief. I know we're running out of time this morning. Lots of things happening. So uh, Homestead Creamery is scheduled to deliver on Monday. They will not because it is a holiday. So they will deliver on Tuesday the 4th. So if you're interested in that, just plan on the 4th. Um, creative writing is uh, still going. The kids are uh, coming back now to VES. So they will be uh, more kids around included with the creative writing group. If you're interested in that, that's going to be happening the 5th and the 19th of September. They usually meet about every two weeks. We're changing location and we're changing time. So we're going to be moving to the Hume Room because the billiards will be occupied with um, a workout space. So we're going to move to the Hume. And um, the teacher who is facilitating the group has asked for a little more time um, because he is really enjoying uh, everyone's writings. And so we're going to move that to 345 instead of 4 o'clock. So in the Hume, 345. Um, there is a trip scheduled to Poplar Forest for the month of September. That is happening on the 12th. There's a sign-up sheet on the enrichment board. So if you're interested, just sign your name there. Um, Senior Symposium officially started yesterday. We had a group uh, go out on the bus yesterday. It was more of a uh, informational, organizational type meeting. No lecture yesterday. A good information. Um, so, if you're interested in that, I do have a, um, this is sort of a incomplete syllabus, but it is downstairs on the enrichment board if you would like to look at that, and I will update that as I get information. Um, Victoria is happening today in here at 3 o'clock. It's a little bit off schedule, but we will meet at 3 to show episode 8 again. So, if you saw it last week, this is a repeat of episode eight. We will show the Christmas episode, sort of tacked on to the end of that DVD. We decided it was worth viewing, so that will be shown right after. If you're interested, just stay for that. So if you have any questions, just give me a call at 3528, or you can stop by my office. Thank you. For the Cultural and Fine Arts Committee for a concert with Monica Fosnow and Emily Chua tomorrow night at 7 p.m. in the Commons. The program will consist of the works of Bach, Debussy, Beethoven, and others. It's that time of year again when Trash and Treasure needs to clean out their storage areas and pull out items for sale. The sale will take place on Wednesday, September 5th from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. in the Commons. And my understanding is they have lots of things for you all to pick from. <coughs> Please join us on Friday, September 7th at 7 p.m. in the Commons as residents perform a, a tribute titled W.C. Sings to honor Charlie and June Plunkett. Join us on Monday, September 10th at 7 p.m. in the Commons for a lecture titled Andrew Weiss burning off context and meaning with Ellen Agnew. Ellen previously gave this lecture at the Mayor Museum of Art at Randolph College as the first annual Sandra S. Whitehead Memorial Lecture. <clears throat> Come and join in the fun and play with clay. Ted Batt and Kim Clark from the Academy Center of the Arts will take you through the steps it takes to make your own pottery on Monday, September 7th, 17th, I'm sorry, at 10 a.m. 
in the activities and programs room, and this class is free. On Saturday, I'm sorry, Friday, September 21st at 4.30 p.m., Connie Sowa will be singing your favorite tunes from the Disney movies we have all enjoyed over the years. Accompanying her will be Linwood Campbell on piano and Tom Minonia on the bass. <coughs> Our trips for September include Lunch Bunch to Water Dog Restaurant on September 11th, the Virginian <coughs> Hotel on September 18th, the Jones Memorial Library on September 19th, and the Virginia Dare Cruise and Lunch is in October on the 23rd, but you do need to sign up by September. For more detailed information, please see your weekly and monthly newsletters, the in-house TV, and the resident website. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, thank you. resident of the month is Lorraine Brown, so be sure to congratulate her when you see her. I know we are short on time, so I'm going to give you a list of things that we have going on in September, and all the detailed information will be in your newsletter, weekly updates on TV, and on the resident website. Our Soulmates Walking Club, our walks will be to Quarry Gardens with lunch at Lovingston Cafe. Peaks of Otter we will go to as well on a walk with lunch at the Peaks of Otter Lodge. Um, I will have essential oil meetings with Becky if for anyone who is interested in meeting with her, as well as Megan Horton, Farm D from Kroger for medication meetings. And as long as the divider is here for our Falver rooms, um, she will be coming. And uh, the information is up, and if anything changes, I will let you know on that as well. Uh, we will have a wellness lecture with Dr. Kevin Ader, optometrist from Family uh, Forest Family Eye Care, um, and it's entitled "What Is Glaucoma." He will um, do offer screenings uh, directly after the lecture for anyone who is interested. Um, they would the cost of that would be two dollars per person. Um, we do have Active Asian Week, uh, so it is a busy month. Active Asian Week is from September 24th through September 28th, and that week we have a lot of different things going on. Carol Friend from um, with Tide Support Group will discuss how to safely manage your diabetes. Master Jesse Teasley will be back to do a presentation on exercises for health and longevity and have a brief lecture on health and longevity. And Julia Harris, fitness professional, um, has been here before, uh, did a program called I Move Freely. I know a lot of people that had come to that would like to see her back again, so she will be coming that week as well. And we will have resident and staff uh, volleyball in the pool that week also. So you'll want to join us that week for a lot of different things. I do want to mention two community walks that will be coming up in October uh, because it's the first of October for anyone who may want to uh, go online and register for these walks. Um, the walk to end Alzheimer's as well as the out of the darkness walk in support of mental health are both on the same day around the same time unfortunately on October 6th. So if anyone is interested in joining the community on either of those, um, you can go online. If you have any questions, you can also contact me as well. Um, so all of our wellness programs on Monday for Labor Day will be canceled along with line dancing as well for the holiday. Um, and you want to join us. One thing, I'm getting ready to uh, mention the renovations to you. So we are going to have our wellness department. We will hold a wellness challenge during the renovations throughout the rest of the year, starting the week of Active Aging Week. Um, I have called it Constructive Steps Through Self-Renovation to try to tie it into all of our renovations. Um, this challenge, again, like I said, will begin the end of Active Aging Week, and so you will see more information on that. So I hope all of you join us to have some fun during our renovations as well. As far as our renovations go, um, the Wellness Department Fitness area is um, closed this week, um, and I do appreciate all your patience with that. Uh, we have started moving things down to the billiards room as far as the small things. Today, the larger things will start moving out. Um, so we are, that's all in the works. Um, so everything that we can get in the billiards room will go down there. It'll be basically um, cardio equipment with limited weight equipment and lots of other things down there. So we're happy to have that area to have a place to go 
during the renovations. Um, starting next week um, in the billiards room, which we're called, calling it the fitness center in the billiards room, um, will open up on Tuesday, September 4th at 6 a.m. and for you to be able to go in. Um, there's not a lot of changes as far as you sign in. We have the sign-in sheets and you'll see all that set up down there. I will be there when it first opens and we will be in and out uh, quite a bit. So we, our office will remain where it is during the renovations, but we will be both places. So we will be very visible for your needs and, and any help that you need, or also working with you as usual. Our classes will remain the same, our class schedule, lectures, all of our other programs will remain the same. The pool will remain open. Um, our locker rooms are open as of today. And um, during then, starting next week, you will enter the pool area through the double doors in the front at the fountain. And that will be the only access to the pool and to our offices as well. Going into the locker rooms, you will go in from the pool area. The back, um, as they were talking about the, the construction, the back will be closed off during, and the hallway during that time. And so that's where we stand with that. Um, does anybody have any questions? All right, and again, I thank you for your patience through the renovations. We're going to have a lot of fun with that, right? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. If you see a Plarner as you move about our community, give them a pat on the back. They have been working very, very hard and continue to work hard. We have now 10 completed mats uh, made out of the Plarning, that, which is yarn made out of plastic bags. Um, I was talking to somebody recently who was in North Carolina and they said that they saw somebody in a convenience store with a Plarn mat. So, uh, they do get used and um, we're really excited to be able to finish our project in the next few months. Um, our goal is 20 mats. Um, stay tuned also to the publication uh, here in Boonesboro. I forget the name of the publication. Debbie? Inside Boonesboro Magazine. Ah, thank you. Inside Boonesboro Magazine. Um, there will be a, a, a story and some pictures about the Plarning project that we have going. Um, anybody like baklava? Yes. The Roanoke Greek Festival is coming September 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. That's a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, amazing Greek food, Greek music, Greek dancing. There's um, a marketplace. There are sanctuary tours. Um, I'm going to go on Saturday, September 22nd. So pay attention to the newsletter and an opportunity to sign up for transportation uh, to go um, be Greek for a day. No Greek tests necessary. Um, if you read your newsletter article from me this past week, you know that we are discontinuing Thursday at 4 o'clock chapel services, at least for the time being. Um, the reasoning behind that is uh, several fold. Uh, first and foremost, because uh, we don't have anybody willing to take that task on to coordinate it. Uh, but also attendance has been uh, low at times. Um, so I'm going to be seeking to find some uh, different new ways to support you spiritually, religiously, and I invite you to communicate with me um, what, what you feel we can provide here for you. Um, there is one exception to that Thursday 4 o'clock chapel service. We will be looking forward to uh, inviting and, and having uh, Bishop Mark Borlakis, who is the, the Episcopal Bishop, here to lead worship with us, and we are thinking it'll be the last Thursday of September, um, but that is tentative at this time, so pay attention to your newsletter and, and uh, all the other ways in which we communicate with you. Any questions? Yes? Where are you going to hold this great festival? Uh, I think are coming here. No, the Greek festival is in Roanoke, uh, at, at the Greek Orthodox Church. <laughs> Sooner than I thought. Good morning. 
morning, everybody. It's the day you've been waiting for. Right? All right, so let's do about nothing at the budget. Uh, this was approved by the board August 16th. Um, so this current budget is a budget for almost plus 30 million revenues, $3 million in revenues. Um, our expenses are running around $28 million. So that should give us a deficit, I mean an excess of $2 million, $2 million, but much of that is not cash based. And that's another complex, and we'll go over that a little bit more depth in a resident finance meeting at the end of September. I need to move through this because there's a lot more sessions to go on present here. Um, some, of the, our, some of the ratios, our operating ratio of budget to be around 100.3 100, 100 versus uh, 98.6, of course we want that to be lower. Net operating margin is about 0.98 versus a 50th percentile of 4.96, we want that to be higher. Net service ratio is around 2.1 and we want that to be higher, but 2.1 is good and the 50th percentile is 2.4. On a cash flow basis, um, we hope to generate $30.8 million in cash next year from all sources. That includes entrance fees. Cash required to run the business is about $30,875,000, so actually we come up a little short, $58,000. <coughs> Today's cash on hand is four ninety six. dollars This includes entrance fees net of about $6,200,000. So that could well be higher and generally speaking, it is a whole, it should be higher. We're still having to send $600,000 to fund our frozen pension plan. We've also included $3.2 million in capital expenditures for next year, and that's not including all the construction, that's just what we need to do inside the buildings. So the highlights, this budget is based on a 2.75% increase. I'm glad to say we have not increased that in the last five years now, Sean. At least five. Um, revenues increased $986,000, or 4.2%. Expenses increased $993,000, or 4.2%. There's a 1% increase in the entrance fees, and a 3% salary increase. Home health, hospice, outpatient rehab revenues increased by $245,000 on average, uh, or 20%, and that being budgeted to break even. WC budgeted for facility-wise all levels care of occupancy across all three levels of care of 93.5. Uh, the capital budget of $3.2 million uh, increases is increased by 633,000. This includes $900,000 earmarked for apartment refurbishments, $800,000 earmarked for the vacated ALU floors. That's in, uh, we'll convert the Brinkett 65 to AL and the vacated fourth floor, fifth floor hard side to AL. Entrance fees are conservatively budgeted at 6.2 which is a $500,000 increase over fiscal year 2018. Um, the 29 budget on a cash basis is projected that these decreased cash by $58,000, we're being very conservative there because generally speaking we've been increasing cash the last five, six, seven, eight years. Resulting in a day's cash on hand of 497, uh, daily cash expenses to run Westminster Canterbury $66,000 a day, or almost $67,000 a day. It's an increase of $4,060. Okay, so that's your quick review of the budget. Any questions? Great, thank you. I need to applause.
that went a lot quicker than I thought. So, um, one uh, big thing to talk about is our cell phone pro uh, program here and uh, uh, building out what we call a distributed antenna system. So, we met with uh, Representative Monday, I guess? Well, last Friday. Um, and we believe that the system will actually be built out this week. Um, now what we have to work on are the carriers. So there's five carriers, and we believe we'll have in the next uh, month, Sprint and U.S. Cellular should be going live. So your phones, if you're a Sprint or U.S. Cellular carrier, should have cell phone service. We expect uh, almost three months out, Verizon and T-Mobile to come online. Six months out will be AT&T, so if you're an AT&T user, you're going to have a longer time to wait to get that service. But um, this is a process, obviously, that the contractor we're working with has to work with each individual provider to get a, a, an agreement in hand. Some of the um, signal will be coming airwaves, some of the signals are going to be coming down through our um, lines that come through uh, for Intellos, uh, Lumos for our internet provider. So uh, it's some different systems being utilized. At the same time, this week and next, uh, they are now running tests where they should be able to figure out what kind of system we can use to enhance the cell phone service outside. So um, get a little technical and it gets over my head here. I think there's two options. One would be uh, just broadcasting a signal from the rooftops, uh, pointing it down towards the cottages and getting signals that way. If that does not work, uh, the option is to have some sort of amplifier or device out uh, boosting the signal out actually on Westminster Way and Bishop's Lane. So we don't know until they run those tests here over the next two weeks. Um, but outside, there is a very good chance that we will probably only have uh, one to two, we're lucky, maybe a third provider for cell phone signal there. So we expect to have all five in the main buildings, uh, but I believe it's going to be cost prohibitive outside. Uh, folks that are not included on the outside, we will be talking to you um, to figure out a way to help you out. So um, I guess the idea of putting a $150,000 piece of equipment on the roof for two or three people that have uh, one of the carriers, it'd be easier to work with you and switch your service over to one of the other carriers and a lot cheaper. So uh, we'll be working with you to figure that out and let you know more as we know more. So uh, we're getting closer and uh, we'll let you know more. I think Nancy Young uh, is going to be writing up something that will be coming out to residents and it'll also be included in my report to resident council. With humankind, we uh, are still what we consider to be in a discovery phase. Attorneys are sending back requests for data back and forth to each other. Uh, a lot of information being exchanged, emails, things like that. Uh, we have our first court appearance September 6, I believe 2 o'clock uh, downtown. We are not um, asking like we had in the past for larger groups to go uh, like we did to city council. There'll just be a few of us down there for these meetings. Uh, expect this just to be a preliminary meeting that will probably result in some other court dates. And uh, we'll let you know more as that progresses. Talk just a little more about the clinic. There's notices up in the elevators. And uh, I think we'll get that also into the newsletter. But the clinic will close Thursday, August 30th. Dr. Lord will see his patients in the morning. And we'll reopen after Labor Day on Tuesday the 4th. We will still respond to emergency calls as needed, but um, just in the transition of getting charts and everything over from one space over to the mailbox area is going to take some time. So um, again, we'll uh, through the process of renovations, people seeing uh, Dr. Lord, uh, Amy McKinney will be asked to uh, report to the temporary clinic over by the uh, mailboxes. I think that is about all I have. And now open up for any questions, comments. Could we have the piece of paper that the dining folks put out with the various limits and so on posted on the resident website so it's easy to access? 
I don't know what you're talking about, but I will try to find limits for... Well, they put out a piece of paper on the new dining plan, and it says, you know, you're allowed to spend so many dollars per day, okay. uh, in, in depending upon what, where you're at, and so on and so forth. If those okay. would be on the website, it would be easy to get to. Uh, we'll get it. You're saying it already came to you once? Okay, so you, you, I'm sorry, you are on the website. Right. Okay. Yes, sir. Sean Belinda can help with that. Okay. Sorry, I had it backwards. Yes, sir. Thank you. Other comments? My usual comment was about the no no sugar added ice cream in the dining facility. I've been reassured, I had been assured in the past that we would have it, but we don't have it yet. Michael's no sugar added ice cream coming. Yeah, we're waiting on the homestead cream and they're developing some flavors for us. So Homestead Creamery is developing no sugar added flavors. I don't believe that's something they have in their normal inventory and they say they are working on that. I was asked to relay these two questions for someone else. However, they do apply, I think, to a lot of people. Question about whether or not we were ever going to uh, consider a second entree. The second one is a uh, possibility of having, um, I call it PRN, somebody who would help the short order cook in the morning when you've got people ordering waffles and scrambled eggs and omelets and so forth. And then the third was um, the request for more of a selection of cooked vegetables. Got Michael DeWinter coming up to answer those questions. Thank you, Michael. Hello. <clears throat> Forgive my voice. I've been dealing with a head cold all weekend. Um, so the entree, we always have more than one entree. If you'll look at your five-week menu cycle that we put out, <clears throat> there's um, an entree at the entree station. There's also a second entree listed as the live action station, which is that chef stage station. So there's always those two entrees available for every meal. There's different prices though, aren't there? There's <clears throat> different prices. So the, on, the chef stage station, um, we price it accordingly depending on what it is. Um, and the entree station is also priced a la carte, but that's where you get that combo, that Canterbury combo for lunch or dinner, which um, is kind of the prefix option for the cafe. In each of the dining venues, if, if you remember, we've discussed we have the prefix menu in the James River Grill, we'll have it in the Dogwood, and in the cafe, because everything by nature, it's a la carte in the cafe, that's your prefix option in the um, cafe. We also have the always available list posted by the trays, and it's also listed again over at the chef stage station. That's where you would get those items. Um, so don't forget those are available. We actually expanded that menu, so we added a few items to that. Um, and those items can be substituted into that Canterbury combo if you like. If, if you're not interested in the entree, but maybe you like the sides that night, you could certainly order the piece of grilled chicken or the salmon or something to replace that entree. So I have been hearing a lot of folks um, question the fact of the one entree, but really there's multiple entrees available. So we always have the entree at the entree station. We always have the live action entree, so that's two. And then what we did was, <clears throat> if you remember before, we had that five week cycle. We had the three entrees listed all the way down to the dessert and the bread of the day. That was wonderful, except when we had an opportunity to get um, a really great fresh fish or something really wonderful that was seasonal. 
um, we were locked into that menu because so many people counted on that menu that we couldn't really change it without it becoming a big um, <clears throat> communication issue trying to make sure that we knew that we were communicating. Also, it didn't give us any flexibility if something came in bad, you know, maybe the produce wasn't um, up to standard or um, a truck broke down that day and we couldn't get something in or whatever, or if we came across a new recipe that we wanted to offer. So what we did was, in the cafe, um, remember the cafe is not the old dining room, so it's, they're, they're two totally different things. The cafe is casual dining. So in the cafe, um, we did the core menu, which is what we've listed, so that's the entree and those items and then the chef stage. Um, but we gave ourselves some flexibility. We increased the number of desserts that are available every day. You don't have just the one option anymore. Um, and then we're also putting out um, additional entrees. If you remember the paella that we did, I think a week ago, um, that had fresh mussels and fresh shrimp and sausage in it, that was another option, another entree option that we did. We've done a pulled pork um, sandwich. We've done a couple of pasta dishes. Um, so you always have those options available as well. Um, and we did. We usually do a, a side vegetable to go with those. So <clears throat> while your menu may only list the one entree and the live action, remember the live action is another entree option, then we're putting out these additional kind of pop-up options for you um, just to kind of, again, allow us some flexibility, some creativity, and a chance to use some fresh um, seasonal ingredients. Because if you think about it, as we, right now, we're working on the fall-winter menu. So here it is, August. We're deciding the menu for February and March. And so to lock that in, um, when everybody wants more options and more choices, um, this was kind of counterintuitive. So by doing the core menu the way we've done it, it gives us the ability to add additional things. So um, we've heard folks ask about more vegetables. You've always got the always available vegetables. I think there's three, four, five of them listed there. Um, we always have vegetables at the entree station. Um, and there's vegetables available at the chef stage station, usually. Not always, but usually. So, um, but we are putting out additional vegetables. Um, I'm a, I love vegetables myself, so I'm, I'm a big fan of vegetables. Um, and then, I'm sorry, what were the other questions? For breakfast? For breakfast, yes, we are working on that. So we have um, usually berry in the morning, um, and then we have another cook that comes in at 8.30 for that live action station, and then Lacey is always there um, starting at 6.30 in the morning. So um, I know she pops in, I popped in this morning to kind of help Barry a couple of times. So um, we will make sure that Lacey's kind of a little more conscious of being out there and that Barry asks for help when he needs it. And then, was there a third question? Okay. All right. Um, just one thing that I discovered this past weekend is that those always available items are not always available on Sunday evening. Um, they should be. We were told they were not. Um, okay, I'll get with you afterwards. I'll find out who and I'll, I'll fix that. Thank you. Any other questions for me? Can you tell us uh, what happened to the soft serve machine and when you expect that to be back in, in service? Yes, unfortunately it's a new machine as we know and one of the pieces broke, one of the plastic pieces chipped and so it won't operate. So we've called and they're shipping us a new piece. They're supposed to be overnighting it to us, so hopefully we'll have that in a day or so and we'll have that machine back up and running. Without the piece that chipped off, um, the, if we put the mix in there, it would just pour straight through. It doesn't hold it back. So I apologize. Um, One of the complaints I've heard and I have myself is that very often the food is cold. I asked somebody about it and they said that the infrared lights over the quote fixed price area for the uh, servings are, do not work. The heat lamps. Is that but, true or not? It seems to me it's true, but I, I don't know. Sure. We did have about three days where it wasn't working. Um, we had the uh, uh, maintenance folks come out. Um, it's still under warranty, so our guys couldn't fix it. Um, and so we had to have a service tech come in from Richmond. They did come in and they fixed it. It was a problem with the wiring. 
So they did get that taken care of. Um, however, even without those heat lamps, that's just an additional boost. Um, the heat wells themselves, we temp our food every two hours. We have to to maintain temps and um, abide by HACCP rules and regulations to make sure it's being held at safe temperatures. So it's always held at 100, hot food is held at 140 degrees or hotter. So I have noticed that, you know, a lot of times um, folks will kind of come to the entree station first, and this used to happen in the old dining room too, I noticed. They'd get their hot food, and then they'd stop by and they'd get their salad, or they'd look at the dessert or whatever, and then they'd go sit down. So, um, of course, you know, hot food's only going to stay hot for so long. Um, so if that maybe is one of the um, situations, um, maybe grab your salad first and then get your hot food so you can go straight to sit down. Um, otherwise, um, feel free to ask us. We can hold it for you maybe. Um, and then worst case scenario, we do have that microwave over by the, um, by the tray return station. But um, I, like I said, I have noticed that that tends to be a pattern for folks. So they'll run into somebody, you know, that they haven't seen in a while and they chat or whatever. But the food that we serve is held at 140 degrees or hotter. Um, so if you have further issues, you know, just let me know and we'll um, look into it and see if we can't figure something else out. We've also got those plastic covers. I know we were using them for a while and I'm not sure why we stopped using them, but we'll bring those back out. Um, maybe that'll help kind of hold, retain the heat while you're getting to your table. Um, Mike, is there a crack in the floor of the pizza oven? Is there a crack in the it floor? Looks of the like pizza there's, oven? Yeah, it looks like there's a crack in the floor. Is that something that's acceptable? Or? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're designed, they're designed to crack. Okay. Um, it's, just, it's just the nature of the beast. Okay. Um, as long as it doesn't go over a certain, a certain size, any stone that big that's heated from below at 500 degrees and is kept at four to 600 degrees above, there's going to be some some cracking. It's it's natural. Yeah. Well, I have several questions. One being, I'm all the way back here in the back. I see you. <laughs> uh, one being, um, I guess the Sunday brunch organization. Mm -hmm. um, this past Sunday seemed to be um, not so well organized. Uh, Took quite a while to get through because nobody knew they were supposed to go up, uh, pay for their meal, and then turn around and come back to the serving areas to receive the food. And these folks that have um, assistance with walking have a problem with doing all this walking, going back and forth. Um, you know, I don't know how better that could be arranged. Well, and I apologize for that. This is exactly why we wanted to serve brunch on the bridge while the tile work was going on. Um, and because of a lot of feedback from, from residents after that very first Sunday, um, there was some insistence that we move it into the cafe. So we knew that the doors were going to be changing, that the tile work was going to be going on, and we felt it was going to be less confusing and probably a little smoother to go ahead and serve it on the bridge because we knew it was coming, but um, I apologize. We did have a sign right at the entrance um, kind of directing people. A lot of people didn't see it or whatever. Um, this should be the only time that we've had to do it that way because we couldn't bring folks into the dogwood like we normally do because we couldn't access it because of the tile work. So starting this Sunday, we will be able to go back to the dogwood entrance, and that should be the normal flow of things. So I do apologize. Okay. And, and he shouldn't apologize. I'll apologize because I was the one that asked Michael uh, to go ahead and go into the new dining space, uh, and obviously complicated with the tile. But uh, I apologize because after having been on the bridge for so long, um, and we had, I think, one of our first brunches out on the bridge after having the areas open, it didn't go so well, and we just thought it was good to get back into those new spaces. So uh, I apologize for that, and I'm sorry. Well, that's, I mean, I don't think any of us had anticipated the tile uh, work to take so long or to keep us from getting into the entrances to the uh, venues. Yeah. The second question is, um, I've been to the grill several times and ordered um, ordered uh, molten chocolate lava cake, and there was none. 
I also ordered uh, sweet potato fries. There was no sweet potato fries. I ordered a, a baked sweet potato. They were out of those. Um, and I was just wondering if there's a problem with ordering enough supplies to keep us fed. We did have, <clears throat> we have had some recent issues with ordering. Um, so that's been taken care of. So there shouldn't be any problems going forward. And again, I, I apologize that happened to you. Well, the other night when we had um, uh, chicken Gordon Bleu, they gave out of the chicken before half of the dinner hour was over. <laughs> Last night, they gave out a grits. They had to recook grits before the um, chef staging thing. Um, you know, there, there just seems to be some difficulty with getting food when we go to the venues. Well, and I, I, I hear you, and I again, I apologize. We've, we've been open three weeks, and so we're still figuring out the flow, not as an excuse, but as an explanation. We're still figuring out the flow. Um, even Sunday brunch is completely different than it was before from a flow standpoint. Um, we're not getting as many reservations as we used to, um, which is fine. Walk-ins are certainly welcome, but people that walk in without a reservation are, are expecting to be able to be sat immediately, and that's not always possible if the tables are full or we're you know, waiting to turn a table or we're resetting a table. So just like out... In the public, if you go to a restaurant and you know you don't have a reservation, you may or may not have to wait for a table. But um, so we're we're still kind of figuring out the flow. We've done three Sunday brunches now in the new venue, and I'm sure if you've come, you've noticed that each week it's been different. Partly because of you know the tile and the construction and all that, and partly because we're we're tweaking it and we're figuring things out each week. Um, the James River Grill has been um, exceptionally popular, which we're thrilled about, we're very happy. Once we are able to open the Dogwood Dining Room, um, which has been delayed because of the tile work and all that, we, we were supposed to open um, yesterday and you couldn't have even gotten to it because of the tile work. Um, and they're using it as a um, path to bring tile in and out, so there's all kinds of construction and stuff going on in there still. Um, once the Dogwood opens up, um, I think that'll relieve some of the pressure from the James River Grill and give you guys a third um, dining option, which we're really excited about, and I think it's going to be well received. Um, so um, <clears throat> again, not as an excuse, um, but as an explanation that there are some flow things that we are still trying to figure out. The chef stage station where the shrimp and grits was last night, um, because we're kind of in that first cycle of the menus, this is week five, so we'll start over next week, and so we'll have those track records to know what items are popular and which ones aren't. Um, we absolutely need to be better prepared. That's not a question at all. But, um, you know, there have been some entrees where, you know, we sell maybe 10 or 12 for dinner, and then we've had others that are 60, um, and we, of course, don't know how many we're going to sell, so we prepare what we think. Um, and then if it's really popular, then obviously it kind of catches off off guard. But we keep really detailed notes, especially when we go through the first cycle of items that um, are well received, items that aren't well received, even down to notes of the weather. If it's a really cold, rainy day, we make notes of that because, you know, our soup um, consumption might have increased over kind of a normal sunny day. So we do keep notes on all of that stuff so that we can be, um, you know, we can make better decisions. The, um, uh, oh. What happened to the boxes for the comment cards that were supposed to have been delivered already? And also, is anything being done about the low seats in the cafe? Yes. And, and third is, when the dining room does open up, will you be able to, with the supply and demand, I mean, you're, you're having problems, you know, stocking food now for the, for the grill. What's going to happen when the dining room opens? B&G Building and Grounds has the comment boxes, so we're waiting for them to mount them. They're here. Um, the, I'm sorry, what was the second question? The seating. Uh, the, the, the seating. The, the, that's in the hands of the architects and designers. We have no control over that. Um, that was one of the very first things that we talked about with them, was we wanted to do away with the pillows. Everything had to be, um, you know, proportionate, um, and we got delivered what we got. 
So immediately as they unboxed them and we realized that the proportions were <coughs> out, um, we've given it to them to deal with, and so they have to figure it out how to cut those little posts down and remount the tables. Um, I've checked on it twice, and I just get that they're working on it. So um, again, it's kind of out of my hands, but I am looking into it. And then as far as the dining venues, um, I can't really go into a lot of detail as far as the supply issues, but I can just assure you that it's been dealt with. And um, as of Friday yesterday, that shouldn't be a problem moving forward. My experience in the James River Grill has been uh, an hour or so to get your food. If you're going to use the same kitchen for the dining room also, what kind of time frames can we expect for getting food to our tables at the grill and in the dining room? Well, I'm sorry, I, I know of a situation where it took a while to get some food. I'm not sure if this was you or not, but um, and I looked at the cameras and I looked at the ticket times, and the ticket time was actually 20 minutes, but people had come in and then they waited for the rest of their party to come in before they ordered. So from the time they first started arriving to the time they actually ordered was probably 30, 40 minutes. So I, I looked into that and I've spoken to that person. But um, if I can get with you and you tell me kind of when that's happened to you, I'll look into what the situation was. But it shouldn't be a problem. Um, we're getting a lot of compliments on the grill and the fact that, you know, the food's really great, the service is good, and that it's coming out hot and fresh and in a timely manner. So I'm not sure what happened with you, but I'll, I'll look into it. Michael, I've had this brought to me several times is, what happened to the spoons? <laughs> and uh, why are the rollers on the chairs in the wrong position? That a lot of people have complained about because it's really hard to, for the, some of these people who are a little bit less physically able than others to move chairs forward and backwards because they were over, the wheel casting that so in the wrong place. The casters, I mean. And I know you can't, it's not to do with the cooking, but I'm just Pat, this is the kind of thing that's come to me uh, a number of times. We, we sit there and they aren't, well, I already said, they don't have spoons. You have to go wandering around looking for a spoon, and you usually get a, get a soup spoon and you want a tablespoon. Well, so for the spoons, um, if you remember the old cafe, you got your own silverware. The soup spoons were by the soup, and then you got your own silverware by those little mirrored um, areas. We thought we were doing a good thing by providing you your napkin and your fork and your knife, kind of your basics, at the table. Um, we have stirrers by the coffee. Um, you know, for that. Um, we have soup spoons by the soup and the oatmeal and all of that kind of thing, which is exactly what we did before. So um, I, the, the fact that that's kind of becoming an issue is, is fairly new to me because it wasn't before. So what we've done now is we are rolling a teaspoon in with the yes. silverware. I'm not going to guarantee that every single roll has one at this point because it may be some from previously and we're still working with, we have several folks that roll silverware, so we're just making sure that everybody has has the information that they need to start rolling teaspoons in. So you should expect to get a fork, knife, and teaspoon in with your rolled silverware at the table. But as before, um, it, you know, soup spoons are by the soup, which is also where we have the oatmeal and that kind of thing. So, you know, be sure you grab a soup spoon like you did before um, in the old cafe. And then as far as the chairs, again, you know, I didn't design the chairs. We, you know, it was. No, I know it's not your fault. I'm just telling you. This yeah. So, um, so to have four, some folks have asked about having four casters, which seems like a great idea, but it would be very unsafe if somebody, you know, needed it for support. It would roll out from under you, or if they went to sit down, it could roll out from under you. So, um, as far as why the casters are on the front versus the back. I, I, I'm, I, I don't have an answer for that. They're designed by people that, you know, do this for a living for healthcare and industries, and um, I'm not sure why the decision was to put them on the front versus the back. All this is people who use them. <laughs> <laughs> Engineers all have to use what they I agree. I agree. <laughs> uh, Michael, the difficulty of getting hot food is a nearly universal complaint, I think. And you've mentioned a couple of 
ways we could help by planning the order in which we get our food. But I notice we, we used to have heated plates, mm -hmm. and we don't have that now. That's unfortunate, I think. Was that a, an omission or what? Well, no, not necessarily. It wasn't on purpose. Um, the melamine plates don't require a heater, just like the china. So if you put hot food on a cold china plate, it detracts from the heat from the food. So melamine is temperature neutral, so it doesn't draw the heat like it normally would on a china plate, if that makes sense. So there's no, there's no reason you can't really heat melamine. So by going to the melamine plates, um, it was actually to help counteract the fact that the china was drawing the heat from, from the hot food. <coughs> okay, I'm not sure about conduction properties of melamine, but I'll have to take, take your word for it. My second question goes back to something uh, Fred raised here, and that is what happened to all the pillows we used to have? We, on Sunday, we couldn't, it was impossible to get a pillow. They were all being used. And we never used to have that problem, I don't think. Well, several, several, um, I, several pillows were in really, really rough shape, so we did get rid of some. I purchased, um, I purchased 24 new pillows, um, and we kept some of the old pillows that were in better condition. But um, it sounds like we need, yesterday or Sunday was the first that I'd heard that we've ever run out. So that just tells me I need to go get some more. And then hopefully once they can figure out the table height issues, we won't require as many. But we'll always keep them around for folks that need them. I realize uh, there's a lot of changes going on and uh, it sounds like complaints, but it's only to to let you know what's happening. And I just wanted to support Mike's um, statement. We, we, we've only been to the grill maybe three or four times, and one of the times was a very long wait, and I don't believe there were a lot of people there at the time. It, was, it wasn't crowded. And, and it was a minimum of a half an hour wait. And we were shown the, the timing thing, and that did not correspond with when we ordered and, and when we got it. So just to support him, we've had that same problem. Okay, well thank you very and much. And then one other one other thing on Sunday when they had the um, the, um, the well the brunch, but it, the meat, the meat. What was the meat that it was a tender one. It was delicious. The only thing is we had to wait about fifteen minutes to get one that, that had some rare so you know, we waited, but when we got it, it was very good. Just when you're in there. Thank you very much. I, I happen to like waffles, and I was under the. Uh, I thought that you all were getting in a waffle machine. Is that true? Yes, we have one. Well, I tried to get a waffle uh, a couple of mornings ago for breakfast. And I could not get a waffle or a pancake because they didn't have the pancake mixture made up. And can you hear me? Yes. Uh, and also, can, uh, I wasn't able to order a, a waffle in the evening uh, several nights ago. Um, I, uh, the young man told me <coughs> that you all didn't have a waffle machine. Well, we don't offer waffles for dinner. Um, it's a breakfast item, and it's new. It's one thing that we've added um, recently. We, the waffle maker that we got, we bought a new one just before we closed down everything. Um, and unfortunately, it got buried in the back of a pod, and we couldn't locate it. But we did locate it, and then we got it clean. And so it is in service now. But we don't normally <coughs> offer waffles for dinner. I see, but for breakfast. Yes. Well, if it's possible. Yeah, to offer it for dinner, is it? I'm, at this point, I'm going to say no, only because the live action cook is doing their entree, their sides, taking care of the pizza, and then also offering all of the always available, so it can get to be a lot, even with help and support. I know I was over there making pizzas last night, but um, um, 
I, I'm not sure that waffles would be something that we'll be able to offer. We're already doing omelets, always available at night. So um, I, it's something I'll think about and consider, and if we can do it, I can certainly add it on. I just don't want to commit to it at this point. Talking with some of the people, they were telling me that as they were bringing their dirty dishes and the trays back, accidentally some of the silverware would be deposited in the trash tank. No. So I don't know what you could do about it, but that's you'd be losing silverware that way. We lose a lot of silverware. It walks away or it gets thrown away. Um, there's not a whole lot we can do. We've tried in the past. We've had the there's these metal magnet things that you can get these covers that, that attract the silverware, but they get all gummed up with other trash and food and things. Um, we try to be as careful as possible in the trash. As you see, we kind of reduce down the size of the opening so plates and other things wouldn't go in there. Um, we just, some loss of it is, is normal. Um, I, anywhere I've been, you know, silverware always kind of gets lost. But um, yeah, we try to be as careful as possible and we do, we can't really dig through the trash. It's not really sanitary or safe for my employees, and we don't really have a place to do that safely. And if there's broken glass or something in there, there'd be injuries. Um, but we do kind of like jostle it to see if we hear anything or whatever. So, um, but thank you for letting me know that. I get, well, it's me again. <laughs> I have a suggestion for the uh, chair problem, maybe. Um, <clears throat> I know you said that it's not safe to put the, uh, the wheels, the casters, on all four legs of the chairs. But how about plastic sliders? Would that not help with the um, movement of the chairs on the carpet? And they the do have, yeah, that's a great idea. Glides. They do have plastic glides on there. Um, I just need to contact the designers, I guess, and see if maybe there's another variety or something that they can put on that might be a little, I don't know, thicker or, or bigger or something. Maybe an inch wide and a couple inches long so that it has that opportunity yeah. instead of a button like size. Like little chair skis kind of. Thing. Yeah, there you go. And also, um, the carry out plates, I had a problem Sunday. The carry-out plates that go with those plastic tops, those plates are so flimsy. By the time I got back to my apartment, all the food, uh, the, the plastic top had come off of the plate, and the food was everywhere. <laughs> so I noticed last night people were turning the plastic top upside down and putting the flimsy plate on the top and using the plastic bottom. Mm -hmm. Is there any way maybe we can take another look at that and get a more sub, uh, so, you know, a plate that's more substantial so that it holds the food? Yeah, so part of that, and I appreciate you telling me that, so we, you're not the only one that this has happened to. If something saucy sits on there for a long time, it soaks into the plate and Part of that is the nature of the plate itself because it's compostable and recyclable. It, it's designed to absorb liquid and kind of break down. Um, we've talked to our people about if it's something that's going to be saucy or potentially really moist like that, is to flip them upside down and use the lid as the container and then the plate as the lid. Um, the other idea that we've talked about is using the black and white check kind of wax paper liners under some things. Um, depending on what the item is, obviously if it's a, something with a lot of gravy or something, you don't want to do that. The other thing that we've talked to our folks about is potentially if it's something like mashed potatoes and gravy, maybe putting the gravy on the, in a little souffle cup on the side so that you could pour it over it when you get back to your apartment to keep that moisture barrier there. Um, so we are working with our folks to kind of come up with some different ideas and different ways to present the food to you because you're not the only one that's had that problem with these plates. Okay, and the other thing, um, the available anytime um, baked sweet potato, mm -hmm. um, is there any way that we could prefix the brown sugar um, 
containers so that when you serve the baked potato, we have the option of picking up the little container with the brown sugar because it's not located anywhere. Yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. We can certainly do that. Um, for the baked potato. We, did that, we, we do that sometimes with Parmesan cheese and stuff for some of the items, but yeah, that's a great idea for the brown sugar. I'll make sure we do that. Yeah, the baked potato was excellent last night, but I had to ask for brown sugar. Okay. So, um, okay, thank you. You're welcome. I'm concerned about some of the pricing of the uh, add-on things, um, like a banana. Um, what costs, the banana now costs a dollar, and I can get six bananas at Kroger for a dollar. And I think that's a little excessive. Um, well, so <clears throat> we, on the fresh fruit, we didn't raise the price that much from what it was before. Um, so, I'm sorry, I didn't see where you were. Oh, there you are. Um, so we didn't raise the price that much from before. Um, I understand bananas are a lot less expensive than citrus fruit or other kinds of fruit. Um, we can certainly look into maybe readjusting that price. I don't see why we couldn't drop the price of the bananas. We kind of kept, just for ease and convenience, we kept all fresh fruit the same price. But I think, you're, I think you have a good point that bananas are, are not expensive. Yeah. Any other questions for me? There's a microphone coming. Speaking of raising prices, Michael, I've seen that the prices of drinks and the bill have been raised rather substantially. As uh, I know some in particular have gone up a large percentage. Any chance that might be revisited? So, well, <clears throat> so here's the here's the explanation on that. Um, a lot of the beer has actually dropped, so beer actually kind of came down. Um, a lot of the alcoholic drinks that use the scotch and whiskey and all that kind of thing, we did raise prices on. Some we raised by 50 cents or so. Some we raised by a couple of dollars because the prices had been held for so long that the cost of the alcohol is, has outpaced it. Um, Hannah did an extensive survey of alcoholic prices of several restaurants throughout the city of Lynchburg and things um, because we wanted to make sure that even though we were increasing ours to cover the cost of the alcohol um, that we were still keeping it below anything you could get outside and I think the closest we got is we're still two or three dollars under um, for comparable drinks of other places. Um, some of the wines have actually dropped, some have stayed the same and then we did bring in one kind of a nicer wine um, that I think increased a little bit. Um, so there has been some increase, just like with the food. Food costs, alcohol costs have continued to climb, even though the prices here were kept um, artificially low. So we had to kind of get play catch up to get back to where it should be, um, or almost to where it should be. Um, so yeah, so there has been some increase in the alcohol prices. But again, some prices have actually dropped and others have kind of remained. The question is in general, I think, we would like to understand the principles of pricing. How the pricing is, well, maybe it's too much uh, to ask now. Maybe it could be a separate uh, gathering where you could explain in detail how the pricing is really done. Well, I can tell you basically um, in, a, in the real world, and this is not what we do here, but generally, Pricing is, food cost is kept around 30, 35% in most places, which means if I purchase an item for a dollar, I triple it and charge you three dollars because a third of it is my food cost, a third of it is labor, and a third of it is my overhead. So that's how restaurants, so when you pay $15 for an entree at a restaurant, it's costing them five dollars to produce that. Um, and then the other five is for labor, and the other five is for their profit and their overhead, their rent, utilities, that kind of thing. Here, we don't operate that. Our food cost is about 45 to 50, 45, 48 percent, usually. 
um, which means that we just almost double the price, and some things we don't even do that on. Um, so to be able to get a piece of salmon out, and I'm sure a lot of you eat out, um, the chance of being able to find it for four, five, or six dollars um, is pretty slim. Um, to actually be able to go to the grocery store and buy a fillet of salmon for four, five, or six dollars is going to be pretty slim. Um, I know I buy I buy frozen salmon at Sam's myself because it's the best price I can find, and for six pieces I usually pay twenty four, twenty six dollars. Um, so, um, and this is. For example, our salmon is fresh, we get it in, we fillet it ourselves, it's a whole side of salmon, it's really beautiful when it comes in. Um, we fillet it ourselves, so it's very fresh. Um, so generally that's how you do food costs. Ours, like I said, we keep about 45, 48% because we don't need to make the profit that we would if we were outside of the community here. Um, dining services is really more of a convenience. Um, for you folks, for the employees, um, it's a necessity, obviously, but it's, a, it's really more of a convenient than it is a, a profit center. So that's how we're able to serve an entire meal for $7 or $9 or whatever um, that you would normally pay $15, $18, $20 or $20 for out at a restaurant, plus, of course, tax and tip, um, which we don't, we don't have here. So I don't know if that answers your question. I'd be happy to talk to you further about it. Um, but that's kind of how we sort of set the prices here. We look at what the cost is, and then depending on what it is. And then it's, there's perceived value, too, which as out in public, you know, maybe I get a good deal on something. And you know, if I triple it, it's only going to be $12. But I, I think you know, it's probably worth closer to 18 I can charge 18 out in public. But here, we don't do that. Any other questions for me? Yes, sir. Just a suggestion, uh, I'm sitting here while you're speaking and looking at a pillow, a parent pillow that's behind you. Oh, there you go. There's one of them. It's incumbent on us as residents if we're going to borrow a pillow from the dining area to be able to return it when we're done with it. Thank you. Thank you. We'd appreciate that. I do, I do pillow rounds every so often and find all kinds of silverware and glassware and things as well. Any other questions for me? Well, thank you. I, I really appreciate the feedback. I do need to know these things because I can't fix them if I don't know that they're broken, if I'm not hearing from you what your personal experience was. But um, I do, I would like to say that um, with all the challenges that we've had, and I'm sorry that we've disappointed you, it really is not our intention at all. We are not doing these things maliciously. We really are trying to think of you folks and trying to make it as good and wonderful as possible. Um, and <clears throat> Again, not as an excuse, but an explanation. We we never stopped serving you. We never stopped cooking, even with tornadoes and power outages and no kitchen half the time. We 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 always made sure that we tried to put a good meal on the table for you folks and give you as many options as possible. And we're still not a hundred percent where we want to be yet. Um, again, we've been open three weeks, um, which may seem like a long time, but. In the grand scheme of things, it's still very new and very fresh for us. We still don't even have all of our construction done. There's a lot of stuff that you don't see that we're not able to put things where they belong. And so there is some confusion because something's here one day and the next day it's been moved to somewhere else or whatever. But please, please know and trust that we are working on it and we do hear you and we do want it to be as wonderful as possible for you. You know what, Michael, I haven't missed a meal yet. <laughs> I haven't either. And they're all good. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. There's always room for Thank you. All right. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Um, we obviously have some growing pains and things we need to work through. Um, still a lot of things going on around here, so I appreciate your patience. Uh, any other questions for the seven of you that are still here? <laughs> All right. Uh, Paul says if you want to go back at lunch, he'll be back here afterwards if you want more questions. I'm kidding. I uh, hope everyone has. I hope everyone has a good afternoon. I do thank you for your time. I was actually sending a message to the designers about the tables while we were sitting here. So, thank you.